Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast. Today I'm going to share with you a message that um, may be one of the most important messages you ever hear. It's concerning your destination, whether heaven or hell. I call today's message, Two Destinies, One Choice. And it comes from Hebrews 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The issue is, where will I be when I die, and which judgment will I be under? Today's message is the beginning of a look into that. One is by default. You go there unless you repent and turn to Jesus. The other is by the choice you make to receive Jesus as your own Lord and Savior. I pray that you are blessed today. We look at some areas in the Word of God that um, we don't hear often preach concerning hell. And then on the next broadcast, heaven. Be blessed as you listen. I pray you listen with all your heart. And if you don't know Jesus, if you hadn't made provision to avoid the default destination, which is eternal separation from him, I pray you will today in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 9. And when I say I'm going to wade into some deep water, I'm going to approach a subject today that we don't hear enough about. Amen? And it's concerning destinies, destinations. You know, where do people go when they die? In particular, where do they go when they die without Jesus? And then what can we do to help them not die without Jesus? Amen? Hallelujah. Probably the least mentioned doctrine in Scripture, but it's one that we need to. Jesus warned about this more than anything else. Jesus talked about hell and warned about it more than he talked about love, more than he talked about money. Amen. In essence, it's the thing he came to keep us from going to. Amen. I believe there is little appreciation for salvation among professing believers because a lot of people don't have a revelation of what they got saved from. Amen. Amen. When you realize what you've been saved from, you can rejoice in what you've been saved unto. Amen. And see, in so much of our ministry today around the world, it's all about the love of God. Yeah, God is love. God so loved the world. God does love. But God also is a righteous and a holy God. Amen. Jesus said all judgment himself was given unto him. Amen. So Jesus will judge the earth. Amen. And so when you go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, this is, <laughs> y'all know this is a miracle. We're going to use one text scripture. That's a miracle. <laughs> now I want us to read it all aloud together. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Amen. If you dare say Amen. Let's read. And just as is appointed from all men once to die, after that, the judgment. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. But notice the Bible says it is appointed unto all men. How often to die? Once. Amen. And after death, the judgment. All men will be judged, the saved and the unsaved. The issue is where will that judgment be? Because one is for everlasting fellowship and joy and blessing, the other judgment is to eternal separation from God forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, as we assemble to hear your word. We pray, God, that you would give me the sense of it, that I might, that you might make my tongue the pen of a ready writer, that you might scribe on our hearts what you would have us to Receive today in Jesus' name. God, we give you glory and thanksgiving for your word as we receive it. You said that your word would not return void. It would prosper where you sent it in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, I want to call today's message two destinies, one choice. Amen. See, I got all them battles back there. Amen. Yeah, I'll use this one. Amen. That's it. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Two destinies, one choice. Amen. 
Hebrews 9, verse 27. And saints, when it comes to the issue we're going to discuss today, today we're going to look at hell. Amen? It's a place. Amen. And next week, heaven. Two destinies. There are only two. And one choice determines where you go. Amen? And the lack of choosing means you automatically go to one. Amen. I call that your default destination. And as it is appointed unto me and wants to die. You know, God just set that thing up, made it so tight, there ain't no purgatory. Amen. There is no reincarnation. That's it. You live once in this physical body and after that, the judgment. But when you begin to look at surveys and how people think, most people generally share two basic beliefs concerning what happens when you die or, as some would say, the afterlife. You know, um, most people believe that, um, yeah, life does not end when you die, but some of the things they believe are absolutely contrary to the Bible. Amen? Most will agree and say they believe in heaven and hell, but what do they believe? Because what you believe determines how you act. Amen? And if you really believe that there were a hell to shun and a heaven to gain, then most people wouldn't be so uh, lackadaisical with their life. Amen? There wouldn't be so much assuming that, well, you know, I'll live and, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll worry about the afterlife when we get to it. That's kind of an attitude that a lot of people have because they don't really believe what the Bible says concerning eternal destinies. Amen. See, the word says here, and after this, the judgment. Now, he's talking to believers here. There's a beam of seat judgment for Christians where we'll be rewarded for the works we do here on earth. That's the one Paul talked about that some, amen, will suffer loss, but they'll be saved as though by fire. Amen. That's not a salvation judgment. That's not a world's judgment. Oh, but in re there's another one called the great white throne judgment. It's not a believer's judgment. It's the judgment of the unbelievers who are already in eternal separation. But after the end, you're going to see that death and hell be cast into the lake of fire. Now, when I said two destinies, one choice, Amen. One choice determines which one or judgment you will be in. Amen. And unlike a lot of people like to think in the United States today, everybody don't go to heaven. Amen. And if we believe that, as so many wrongly do, that most people will just automatically go to heaven, one of the fallacies that comes from that, it takes away the urgency from the gospel we preach. Amen. See, if we really believe that people we know that don't know Jesus, they're one breath, one heartbeat away from eternal separation, it might shake us from our shadows. Boy, the amens are coming slow. It's still so. Amen. Even the man uh, in the parable in Luke 16, the rich man in Lazarus, even he burning in hell. Didn't want anybody to go there. Amen. So my question is, do we really believe as believers that hell is as the Bible describes it? I remember years ago, this was before I got called into the ministry. I remember I had a, um, I'll say a dream, it may have been a vision, but what I saw was like a, um, uh, um, a vision of the great white throne judgment, as it were. And, and I didn't see Jesus. But I was, you know how movie theaters, the seating kind of starts and it goes lower and lower as you get closer to the front so those in the back can view the screen. That, that's kind of the setting, but there was those multitudes of people all around. And, and as far as you could see, like the Bible says, a sea of people. And all I could see at that point was a hand that would speak out and say, depart from me, ye, me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. I'm just standing back there, praise God, I'm saved, I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm just going down with the crowd. Amen. Amen. Because that was not the believer's judgment. Now, at that point, as a young believer, I didn't know that. 
because generally we thought everybody was going to go to the great white throne judgment. So I'm just going to praise God. I'm not concerned. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. Glory to God. And I get up there and I see a hand go out and say, they went. Because you didn't tell them about me. I believe that could be all of us. Amen. Who is it that may not make heaven because we were scared to tell them about Jesus? Amen. And see, that's one of the things we're going to answer. To. What are we going to do with his son? We're going to keep him to ourselves or are we going to share him like everything else we like? Amen. Now, I don't want to stay on that vein this morning, but we're going to look at this place that people go to. Amen. Because a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about this place called hell. Somebody say hell. You know, there are actually like five different words for hell, amen, and they represent different aspects of it. We won't get into this on today, but just for your personal study, if you go and research the issue, amen. But a lot of people have misconceptions about heaven and hell. In the world, they like to think everybody does. Some people think when you die, you go get wings. Well, the Bible don't teach that. See, we need our theology to be right. I've seen them give out in funerals, amen. They'll give out items and pictures that have the person that is deceased with wings. No, that's not true. You don't get wings when you go to heaven. That came from this wonderful life. <laughs> amen. It didn't come from the Bible. Amen. In other words, the Bible has to be our authority on these issues. Some say a loving God wouldn't send anyone to hell. How many of y'all ever heard that? Amen. Well, loving God don't send people to hell. It's automatic. If you don't get saved, you're automatically going. God don't have to do anything. He's done all he can do legally when he sent his son to die in our place. Amen. And then some say, well, you know, good people go to heaven. How many of y'all heard that before? Well, Romans 3.10 says, there's none righteous, no, not one. None of us are good enough to go. Amen? And so a lot of our misunderstanding leads to our lack of action when it comes to those that don't know Jesus. Then some believe, believe and this is where your alternative religions come in, that, you know, well, if you're not good enough to go to heaven when you die, then you get a chance during in this place called purgatory where you kind of pay penance for your sins and let somebody buy you out due to indulgences so you can escape hell and go to heaven. Well, that's what Catholicism believes. That's not right. Amen. Some believe in reincarnation. You know, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe when you die, you're annihilated. Amen. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says from the moment you are conceived, you will live forever. The issue is where will you live? And the shortest part of our existence is right here on earth right now. And so every person, everyone we know, you and I too, have an appointment with death. By the way, to help you to understand, death always means separation. Death never means a cessation. Amen. We don't cease to be when we die. Amen. You know, when we were born in sin, it's called spiritual death. It means we're born in a state of separation from God, doesn't it? We still have life in our bodies, but it's not the life of God. If we die without the life of Christ in us, we die and go to hell. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, um, so death is a separation biblically. At the point of death, this physical body returns to the dust, but my spirit and soul go to be with Jesus if I know him. Amen? And he's going to raise up that body when he returns. Amen. And so we have to understand, death does not mean an ending. Amen. But death is for every person a transition. For us to be absent in the body, if we know Jesus, means we're present with the Lord. Well, on the flip side, if you're absent from the body and don't know Jesus, you're present and it's in hell. Only two destinies for individuals. Only two places we go, and we're all going to live forever in one or the other. And that makes this an unpopular message. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's not one that people will go, man, likes and thumbs up. Generally, when you put it out there in the online world for people to listen to and hear, but it is needed. Amen. For the sake of our knowledge and to spur us to good works in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, no second chance. Amen. Then there are a group of people, they could just care less. 
Amen. But unfortunately, some believers share some of those same beliefs. There was a popular book out probably about 15 years ago called Love Wins. In the end, everybody goes to heaven. And it brought a lot of false doctrine to the church. Amen. You know, and then we've had people that were professing believers that we used to listen to, like Carton Pearson, you know, just became a universalist. Yeah. You know, no, no. God didn't change when they changed. Amen. 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 If there's a hell, some people believe then really bad people are the ones that go there. See, we've heard those kind of things, haven't we? Well, I can't. Hitler, yeah, people like that, they go to hell. No, any person that dies without Jesus does not go to heaven. Amen. Amen. He is the only way. Amen. There is no other way. Amen. And so hell, I say, is the least taught, but it's one of the most undisputable facts in all the Word of God. Amen? And so if we're going to handle the whole doctrine of God's Word, we got to deal with this issue, heaven and hell. People don't man talk. We don't hear much teaching about heaven either, do we? See, that's where all the misconceptions come from. We'll look at those next week. Amen? But this issue of hell and what we think about it is based on whose authority we receive. Amen? You know, um, is it going to be our human reasoning? Because hell's a horrible place. It's beyond our ability to really conceive of a place so horrible, so painful, amen, called eternal, does not end, amen, that it's easy to try and just gloss over it because it's, it's too hard of a concept. And even with our limited knowledge, we really can't grasp how bad it really is. Amen. And... Um, and so we're going to wade through some of the bad news, and then we're going to get to the good news because those that are here this word, it might be your default destination, but you can turn and not go. Amen. Amen. See, in all of that, there's good news. But before the good news, and this is why so many, I believe, one of the main reasons why so many people pray a prayer, say they gave their life to Jesus, and then two weeks later, they're back doing what they did before is because they have no concept of what they were saved from. Amen. See, the good news don't make a lot of sense until you understand what the bad news is. Amen? And so a lot of people don't appreciate their salvation because they don't have a revelation of what we were saved from. Amen? Hallelujah. I thank God that I'm saved from the torment there. I, I thank God for that, but I know what it is. And so if people don't have an understanding and they don't base it on the authority of God's word, then their um, urgency is affected to share the good news that people don't have to go with others. I believe we need this more and more because it's not just America that's going to hell in a handbasket. Amen. The, uh, it's not America that's going to hell. It's the people. Amen. That are going. Amen. And see, we've got to have a source of our authority. I am not the authority source for truth. You're not either. See, a lot of people have misconceptions about heaven and hell because they reason, man, if I were God and a loving God, I, I really couldn't, why even have a place? Every, you know, that people would go and suffer torment and pain and the burn forever. You know, in their minds, that's what they would do. You know what I call that? That's idolatry. That's making a God in your image that do what you think God ought to do. Well, God doesn't operate based on our standards. And God don't want anybody to go there. Matter of fact, we'll give you a scripture later. God's intent is that none go. Amen. But our default destination without Jesus is to go. Amen. And so we have to settle the issue of truth. John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by thy truth, or through thy truth, thy word. Somebody said, thy word. Thy word is truth. And so the settled issue is the word of God. Amen. This thing Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's truth. Amen. In uh, John chapter 1. Amen. You know, uh, when we say, and the word became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us, and we beheld the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
See, truth is the person of Jesus. Jesus, who made everything, is the source from which truth derives. He is truth. And so what Jesus says concerning the issues of life, eternity, marriage, or anything else is the source that we have to receive if we're going to please God. Not our minds, not our mentality, not our trying to wrap our thinking around it. What does God say? And then our challenge, beloved, is to receive what God says as the final answer, irresponsive of how it makes me feel or whether it makes sense to my head. Amen? And so God's word concerning this issue of eternal destinations, he said, it is appointed unto me and once to die, and after that, the judgment. His word is the settled issue on that forever and ever. Amen? And so according to Jesus, then death is an inescapable fact. Amen? You know, now we all are going to die once. There is a second death that the Bible talks about. Amen? But if you die without Jesus, it only gets worse when you get to what's called the second death in the back of the book. Amen? And so it's an inescapable fact. There, you know, it's a, he said a point, it is set that all men die once. So no matter how much they fiddle, we've got people that have stored their bodies in cryogenic chambers. Amen. Got themselves frozen, waiting until technology comes up that can bring them back. You know, once they cease breathing and they're dead, there ain't no bringing them back. Amen. Amen. No matter how wealthy they are, how much they think they can. You've even got people now trying to find a way to transfer their consciousness, I'm going to say their spirit, into <laughs> computers. You got people throwing that kind of thought around because why? People want to live forever. It's appointed unto all men to die once. Gonna die. Amen? Ecclesiastes 3 verse 2 says, there's a time to die. Amen? And so we all are going to go through that door of death and transition. What we believe and who we trust determines which destiny we transition to. For you and I who know Jesus, it's a settled issue. When we leave, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. But for those that we're not, we need to not allow that to be left to chance. We need to tell them about Jesus, don't we? Amen? So his word is a settled issue on that. And so after that, all will be judged. That's why I call this two destinations, one choice. The place people like to talk about is heaven. Usually, you know, when it's a homegoing service, we act like everybody's going home to be with Jesus. Amen. They were a good person. They would give everybody the shirt off their back. Well, you know, that, that, that don't get you to heaven. See, that's works. Amen. And my job as a pastor is not to try and preach them into heaven if I know they won't save. Amen. I'm going to say I knew them. They were a nice person. Amen. But I want to talk to the living. Because a living that are confronted with the specter of death needs to make sure they don't die and go into eternal separation. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Life is serious. Amen. But it's a, it's a tragedy if you go into eternity not knowing the Lord Jesus. You can't come back. Amen. It's irreversible. And our job is to see that as many as we can be it playing role in not having them to go. We want to do it, don't we? Amen? Heaven. That's where all believers go. We transition there at death, don't we? No, Jesus said in John 14, 3, we love to read, in my Father's house there are many mansions, but he said, I go to prepare you a place. And he finished by saying that where I am, there, ye shall be also. Well, the Lord Jesus is in heaven. He said that where I am, there you will be. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. And so for you and I, the moment we close our eyes here, instantly we are transitioned to be there where Jesus is. Psalm 16, 11 says that in his presence, there is joy. Amen. You know, so that's what lies ahead, you know. Now when we understand where we're going and what lies ahead, it can help us to make it through all the stuff that goes on here. 
because my roots aren't planted here on this earth, earth in, this, in that respect. I'm on my way to be with Jesus. Amen? See, a lot of people feel like if all their success, all their pleasure and everything is tied here, then that's what they live for. We're to live for what comes after. Amen? And once we know Jesus is Savior, amen, we go to be with him when we die. Amen? And I thank God that we do. Amen. And so we look forward to that. Amen. You know, most believers don't look forward to that. But Paul said, look, to stay in the flesh is better for you. But he said to depart and be with Jesus or Christ is far better. Didn't he say it? Amen. So for us, it gets better when we go to be where our Lord is. Amen. I thank God this is not the best that it ever be. But I like to phrase it this way. The most hell you, you and I that know Jesus will ever experience is what we experience right here on earth. Amen. Amen. All the stuff, all the pressures, all the segregation they're bringing us to, all the criticism, all the divisions that the world is bringing our way, and the persecutions that are coming, that's the worst it will ever get for you and I. Amen. Once we leave here, it's only better. Amen. Now, for those who don't know Jesus, the best they'll ever know is right here. And when they die, it only gets multiple times worse. Because to go out into a Jesus-less eternity is as bad as it can get. That's having a bad day. If you die and wake up in hell, that's a bad eternity. Our job, amen, is to convince as many as we can not to go. Amen? Let's look at hell for a moment. You know, it's a horrible place. It's just, you know, we've seen movies, you know, where you see all the, the flames and all those kind of things, but it's, we can't imagine what hell is really like. This really goes beyond our imagination. As harsh as we can make it, it's much worse than we can imagine. I don't believe we can really imagine, amen. You know, it's the place that Jesus warned of more than anything else. He describes some of the things that goes on there, and he said, he didn't want you to go. Amen? Hell. Amen. Somebody said hell. hell. I remember years ago as a young guy, I got a set of messages called, what in hell do you want? Because a lot of people persist in living their way in spite of where they may go. They've got misconceptions. A lot of people think if they go to hell, all their friends be there. How many of y'all heard that before? Yeah. When I get there, I hear one guy's witness, and man, when I, get, when I get to hell, I'm going to party with all my friends. But the Bible says that also it's a place of outer darkness. You won't be able to see them. And if you didn't see them, you might hear them screaming, but they're not going to have time to talk to you. I believe that people there will be a little bit preoccupied with their current state. It's not a place of fellowship. And see, people are trying to soften that to avoid the issue of, I need to get right with Jesus. What does the word say concerning that? And this is just a few scriptures. Amen. But it's described as a place of torment. Go to Luke chapter 16. It's also described as a place of punishment beyond anything we can imagine. But along with the punishment, we find also the thought of regret. Jesus described at one point what profits a man to gain the whole world and lose his very soul. To die without Jesus is to lose your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, and, you know, your spirit. You know, in your soul is where you decide, I'm going to get up, I'm going to do this today, I'm going to go here, I'm going to enjoy this food, I'm going to take a little rest and enjoy that as well. Well, see, that comes from your thought processes as you direct your body to do as you tell it to do, doesn't it? Well, if you lose your soul, you can want to go somewhere, but you can't go. You lost the ability to move from one area to another. You've lost your soul. People in hell don't want to stay there. And they can think that there's no way out. And so he says, you've lost your soul. Notice here in Luke 16, the parable is not a parable. We call it a parable. 
But in verse 19, Jesus said there was a certain rich man. So evidently, this was someone that these people knew. Amen. And he also described a certain beggar. Notice this. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was living high on the hog, enjoying life. Amen. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. So on one side of the gate, this man is living in the best that life can get him. Right at his gate, there's a man at his gate, poor, a beggar, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom at that, part, at that time was the upper compartment of Hades. It was called paradise. Amen. Well, Jesus emptied paradise. Paradise is now in heaven. But at that point, it was called Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, notice verse 23, and in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. See, there's not a party atmosphere there. He was in torment, excruciating pain, and see it, Lazarus, so far off. See, before Jesus ascended on high, you know, the Bible says he descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he led captivity captive in Ephesians 4. He led people from Abraham's bosom to heaven. That's why Matthew 27, 55 says that the spirits of the saints rose, that rose with him went into Jerusalem and appeared after his resurrection. That's amazing. Amen. But that compartment is emptied. Now when we die, we go to be with Jesus. Amen. But here they could see one another. And so Lazarus, amen, Abraham, in Abraham's bosom, he saw Abraham and he saw Lazarus in his bosom, in this place, this compartment. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. You know, this man, one of the, that tells me that your nature is what you retain when you're in hell. He's still looking at the beggar as a servant. And so he said, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water <laughs> and cool my tongue. So evidently there was water where Lazarus was. For I am tormented. Somebody said tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, my says, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to you that would not come from thence. In other words, you can't direct, you, you can't control where you go. You're in one place. Then said he, I pray thee therefore, Father, and that thou would send him to my father's house. In his selfishness and his separation and his pain, he still did not want his brethren to go there. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them. He's still talking about sending Lazarus. At least send him to tell my brothers that uh, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. That tells me right there if they won't hear the word of God. Amen. If you or I were to raise somebody from the dead, they found a way to doubt that too. Jesus said that. This was written in red, isn't it? Amen. He said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. He said to Abraham, uh-uh, no, it won't work that way. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, the one rose from the dead. Amen. In other words, if you don't believe the account that Jesus said, amen, if you saw a miracle of somebody being raised and you're fixed to reject Jesus, you still won't believe. That's special effects. Who knows what they'll say? Amen. But they won't believe it. They would reject it. But notice he talks in terms of torment and pain. And he says, flame in verse 24. You know, that's what hell is about. It's a place of torment. Flames that are not extinguishable. Even if Lazarus could have gotten some water, it would have evaporated before it even touched his tongue. 
But notice in hell, people have full consciousness. He had remembrance of his life before he died. He remembered his brethren. Amen. He had compassion in their state if they went, wanted them to be warned. I don't know if maybe that means that people in hell are praying that some of us would tell their loved ones, don't come here. Because you don't want anybody to be there in that place of torment. Wow. But you know, that's not all the Bible says concerning. And we don't really have time to go through all the scriptures that the Bible mentions concerning this place that Jesus warned about. And since this is in the parable, that's a literal account. And some 2,000 years later, this rich man that people believe name was Diabetes is still there. 2,000 years is short time when you look at it in light of eternity. Amen? And so that means that it never ends. It's a place of torment and pain forever. Verse 10 in Revelation 14, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day or night. Man, you would think that there would at least be whew, plain stop, no rest. So that tells me then that this place hails a place of no rest. Day or night, forever. You don't want to go. You don't want people you know to go. This is the authority, the word of God. Go back to Matthew 18. And I only want to read a few scriptures that the Bible mentions concerning this. But what we hope to do by the grace of God is to stir in us, I don't want people to go either. So we need the word on this particular matter. I pray to build in us that desire in Jesus' name. Matter of fact, Jesus taught concerning hell. Verse 3 in Matthew 18, he says, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name, receive it in me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me it was better for him that a millstone were hanging about his neck and that he was drowned in the sea. And in that context, Jesus began, and I'll skip verse 7 for time's sake. He said, Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maim, rather than have two hands or two feet cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than have two eyes to be cast into hell fire. In other words, it's better, he said, that you lose a limb of your body and go to heaven, with hell, heaven without it rather than go to hell with it. He's not literally telling people, cut off your hand or pluck out your eye, but you know, we can't function without our hands, can't see without our eyes. Amen. In other words, even if it costs us that to avoid going there, he's trying to get across how much he desires people to avoid this place. And that's not all he says about it. Matthew chapter 9, you know, he used some other terminologies about this place. Can y'all hang with Pastor a little bit? See, see these things that, you know, we generally kind of don't read. We kind of read over this kind of stuff. See, the gospel is good news, isn't it? The good news is people don't have to go. But if they don't know Jesus, they will go. Amen? Now, notice in Matthew chapter 9, verse 42. Not 42. Amen. <laughs> there ain't no 42 there. 
<laughs> Amen. Well, I'm going to just quote the scripture where Jesus warned that there would be, what, weeping. Somebody said weeping. So evidently you can cry. He also used the term gnashing, didn't he? Amen. That in hell people would be weeping and gnashing. The word gnashing literally meant grating their teeth. Why? Because of the torment. But it's inescapable. Amen. You can't get out no matter how much you get out. Another time Jesus said in that place it would be a place where evidently your body must be going through a process of decaying. It's not decaying. He used the term worms. Now, for those who are uh, not, he said maggots. Amen. And he said they would never die. Amen. So it, it, evidently it seems like there'll be something eating at you as you burn, as you suffer, as you regret the fact that you're there. Amen. And you want some refreshment and can't get it. You know, heaven's called a place of rest. Amen. And so in this place, there is no rest. Amen. It's a place of eternal. Somebody say eternal. Eternal punishment. Second Peter chapter 2. Um, Peter e even talking about this place. And he uses the word punishment. He said, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. Amen. See, you're punished for things that you did wrong. See, all people, the saved and the unsaved, are going to be judged for their works. Every deed I do in the body as a Christian, I'm going to be judged for my motives. Why did I do it? Did I do it to have the applause of men? Amen. Every time I give, I'm not the one that got to hold it up so everybody can see it. Well, Jesus said that was my reward. Amen. See, what well, you and I at the beam of seat judgment, we'll be judged based on our motives. Am I serving God just for prosperity or am I serving him because I love him? And see, if my works aren't with the right reason as a Christian, they'll burn. They could be straw, hay, or stubble, but at least I'm in. Amen. Hallelujah. But the unbelievers will be judged, too, according to the, their works that are listed in the books. And based on why they did what they did, they'll be whipped with, oh, people get whipped yeah, it, with few or many strikes. Doesn't the Bible say that? And so even in the place called hell, there are degrees of punishment. Well, you know, I've been a pretty good person, so I won't be as hot. It doesn't matter. It's still hot. See, people try and reason their way around. No, no, no. Either way, it's going to be unquenchable. It's going to be everlasting. It's going to have no respite. And then in the end, in what's called the second death, after people are judged for their works, both death and hell are cast into the lake of fire that burn. Man, I can't imagine something worse. And so Jesus is saying, don't go. And unfortunately, that's the default destination of every person that's born on earth. If you don't choose Jesus, that's where you go. There's no avoiding it. There's no way around it. But pastor, I, I, I didn't do, I, I didn't treat people like Saddam Hussein. I, I, I didn't treat people like Hitler. It doesn't matter. The issue is not what you've done. The problem is how we were born. We were born in sin, and that makes hell our default destination. And if any person is in a state of being separated from God, which is spiritual, to be spiritually dead, their default destiny, you know, now I'm going to accept kids who are not at the age of accountability. Amen. But at some point, sin revives, like Paul said, and they died to sin. But in their innocence, yeah, I believe little babies and children, they will go to heaven. Amen. But that don't mean once you understand right and wrong. You understand there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. You know the difference between how you are living and how you ought to live. No excuse for you. Amen? By the way, nobody goes to heaven on parents' coattails. Amen? Somebody that, well, my mom and daddy Christians. That, you know, no, there are no stepchildren in God's kingdom. 
So you're all going to be a child of God or not. Amen? See, there's no <laughs> progression that way. Amen. But well, why is it that way, Pastor? Well, Adam. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, when Adam died, we died. See, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Adam was our representative. Now, as we've been teaching in Bible study, beginning in Genesis 1, 11, all things reproduce after his kind. The Bible says whose seed is in itself. The male carries the seed. When Adam disobeyed God, he yielded to the lie of the devil. At that point, Satan became the god of this world. Adam died spiritually. And all the seed that came through the relation with him and Eve, amen, were born in that same spiritual state. See, that's what Romans 3.23 means when it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, the problem is not our good works. This, this is why good works can't save. It's why being altruistic don't work. It's why you can be a philanthropist and give away billions to the poor. It's why you can do all of these good things because it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, Titus 3, 5. But by the grace of God, you and I are saved. And so our works can't get us right with God. Good works are commendable. We ought to do good works. But if you're doing good works, hoping that will earn you. It's by grace that we're saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Amen. The Bill Gates of this world and other people who are working to give away their money. Amen. They can say, but I gave all. It's not of works because you could boast. It's by the grace and favor extended through God who by grace gave Jesus. And if you don't receive what God gave, you don't go. God's desire is that none perish, that all people come to a place of repentance. And so people have to understand then that it's not your works, it's not your actions, it's not your good intent. You are born in sin. Romans 5, 12 says, for us by one man, sin entered the world, and as a byproduct, death, and death passed upon all men, which is separation for that all men of sin. We're born in sin. Psalms 51, 5 says, we were conceived in sin. Amen? And so we are born in a state of being separated from God. So our good works and all those things can't save. We need something more. And the thing we need, we can't earn because it's not by works. But God. Somebody said, but God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But God did. He did something about our state. Amen? Matter of fact, hell's the place that Jesus warned concerning, more of concerning anything else. He warned about this place. That's why God sent his son so people wouldn't have to go. See, that's really wrapped up in the essence of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Zoe, life as God has, not in separation, but in fellowship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's God's will for mankind. Amen. The default, you know, when we talk about one, two destinations, one choice, you know, when you go and use your computer, you pull up your uh, search engine, you know, sometimes, would you like to make this your default homepage? How many of y'all, y'all ever see that on your computer? And if you choose that as your default homepage, whenever you go online, that's the page it's going to go to. Amen? That's your default. It automatically goes there. And so that's how it is with mankind. The default destination is hell. God wants no one to go. And he loved the world so much that he gave his son. See, the bad news is we can't get good enough to get right with God. The good news is God didn't tell us to. He sent his son to live the life that we couldn't live, to die in your place and in my place. Amen. And then once he was raised from the dead, when I receive his son, God receives me. Now, that requires a choice. The default destination is eternal separation. By choice, you don't have to go there. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You know, woo. Look at, I'm going to give y'all two more scriptures. First Peter 3.18, and then 
we're going to get on some good news. Amen. Y'all still love Pastor? He going to say it in a way. Amen. <laughs> Y'all know me better than that. <laughs> Amen. I am theophobic. See, if we fear God, we won't hold back for man. Amen. Notice in, this is good news right here, 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also has suffered for sins. My sins and yours, he suffered for. This is why he came. Amen? This is why he was virgin born, Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman without sin to redeem us. He had once suffered for sins, the just. Jesus was just. We were unjust. Amen? That he might bring us to God. See, this is, the good, this is why Jesus came. For God so loved that he gave him, but he came, excuse me, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the spirit, but made alive or quickened by the spirit. Amen. See, he came as our substitute, didn't he? So the death that he died was so I wouldn't have to die in that separation. He bore that separation. That's why Jesus on the cross said, my God, Elo, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, why hast thou forsaken me? He bore, he was forsaken of God so you and I could be brought into the presence of God. The cross is a place of exchange. There at the cross, Jesus took upon himself my sins so that when I come to Jesus, he can give me the free gift of his righteousness. Amen. He loved me so much that the sinless son of God he said, in all friends, you had no pleasure, but a body thou hast prepared for me. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. And he lived a sinless life. And he was carried out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil in Matthew 4. And the same test Adam filled. Jesus, the second Adam, fulfills. Utterly qualified to pay the price for your sins and mine. And he died as a man, righteous, but he died the death of a sinner. He was our substitute. Amen. 1 Peter 2, 4 says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. God laid our sins upon Jesus so that you and I wouldn't have to die and be separated from God forever. When God received it and said, it is finished, if you receive Jesus, the judgment don't come on us. Amen. But it requires a choice. Jesus came so you could have a choice. See, hell wasn't made for you. With all the descriptions that I gave concerning hell, a few of how it's described, you know, there's smoke there too. Amen. I can't imagine burning and having flame but no light. It's out of darkness. The good news is he didn't make it for us. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, that hell was made for the devil and his angels. Amen. See, men only went because they sat it was Satan in the garden and we received that sin nature through Adam, but we have the right to choose where we'll spend our eternity. Two destinies, one choice. Those that we witness to, we need to give them an opportunity to choose. You know, God even told the nation of Israel, choose this day whom you're going to serve. See, there's power in our individual ability to determine our destiny. God gave us that because he made us in his image. And even though we are destined by default to spend eternity in separation, Jesus paid the price of that separation. Our sins are already forgiven. When you read Colossians 2, 13 and 14, it says he's already forgiven us our sins. He paid the price, didn't he? And so if people would turn to Jesus, place their trust in him, receive what he did. That choice delivers you from the eternity of separation. Amen. Hell wasn't made for you. It was made for the devil and his angels. Jesus came so we could have a choice. John 5, 24. I know I'm mentioning a lot of scriptures today, but we have to get this. He says, he that believeth on him that sent me. He that believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. If you believe on Jesus that God sent, you can have everlasting life. Notice what else he went on to say. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. See, that's good news, isn't it? Oh, but it requires a choice. Amen? 
Heaven is your destination by choice. It's not automatic. And it's not a hard decision to make when you understand the consequences. We understand that God, he can't just say, all right, I, I, I sent this one, because, but I'm going to let you go because you're just so good looking. God's just. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Amen? None of us can merit going. That's why we need grace. Amen? That's God's unmerited favor. There's an acronym for grace that says God's riches at Christ's expense. See, Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He bore all the pain. He bore the separation so that you and I could be brought into God's presence but requires that you and I do something. Amen? And the issue really comes down to what are we going to do about this man, the Son of God, Jesus? All of us that are saved, we've already done something, but we know people that have not. Amen? We're born in sin, but through the grace of God, we can be born again. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a, a righteous man in the worldly sense, but he said, I say unto you, you must be born again. Oh, do I need to go back into the womb and come out? No, I don't mean that. He was talking about being born again of the Spirit of God. What's born of the Spirit is spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And in Adam, we were all born in the flesh in a state of separation. But now... You can be born again of the Spirit of God. How? It's simple. Amen? See, we don't have to allow people. Well, I'm young. You know, I got to get out there and sow my wild oats. That's a lie of the devil. A lot of young people don't get a chance to get right with God. They die young. See, whenever the devil is trying to get you to procrastinate, you need to realize you need to take some action. One of Satan's biggest tactics is to tell you you've got all the time in the world. Amen, that God will take you just like you are. See, a lot of people think they can get saved and keep living like they were. If you don't repent, you don't get saved. Thank you. Amen. That's still true. Amen. And so we don't preach repentance in the church world like we ought to. Just add Jesus to your stuff. He loves you. That, you know. All you got to do is pray this prayer. How often we hear that? If you pray it, Polly the parrot can be taught to pray the prayer. The issue is where's your heart in it? Amen? In other words, if you don't turn, I'm going to give y'all a quick ABCs of salvation and then we'll close. Amen? Now, that's an ABCs. It might, it's not just ABC. It might be some Zs in there. But number one, A, you need to accept God's provision. Amen? And so when we're witnessing the people, if they don't receive the God that saved us, and when we're saved, they got to accept God's remedy. It's Jesus. For God so loved the world. God loves the world. Amen. See, it's not God's will that any should perish but it all should come to the knowledge of the truth. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? They need to accept the remedy for sin, which is Jesus. Amen? And Jesus is a gift. You don't earn gifts. You receive gifts. Amen? I can't work enough to get what you're trying to give me. You're trying to give it to me by grace. It's almost like somebody's trying to give you a present. What I got to do to get it? Nothing. I'm giving it to you. Oh, no, no. That's too easy. How often have we heard people say that? There's got to be more to getting saved than that. No, he told us what was needed. We need to receive. God gave. Our job is to accept what God gave. Now, there are terms to receiving what God gave. Amen? God gave. Now, notice what else, you know, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But the gift, say gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So Jesus is described as the gift. Amen? Matter of fact, God even gives you the faith to believe in Jesus. 
The Bible says God has given to every man in Romans 12, 3, the measure of faith. So we can believe that God gave Jesus. We can believe that God raised him from the dead. Amen. But see, we've got to accept what God said as being true. Amen. Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. Not by good works, not by trying hard, not by turning over new leaves. You got to receive how God described him. Amen. Somebody say accept. And then God requires you to believe. See, a lot of the world has a problem receiving Jesus, don't it? They'll receive him as a good man. Yeah, 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 Jesus, yeah, he's a good man. Amen. Well, yeah, yeah, I give him a prophet. But this thing about the Son of God, see, people wrestle over that, don't it? Either he is who he said or he's a liar, lunatic, or worse. He is who he said. And he loved us so much that he left heaven and took upon himself our flesh without sin. Amen? I read some surveys. They said that like 60% of profession Christians believe Jesus sinned while he was on earth. That makes me question the salvation. Huh? Amen. Yeah, because Jesus was without sin. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. He said, the devil cometh, but had nothing in me. Amen? He was without sin. So, A, you need to accept or receive Jesus as God's gift. Two, you need to believe what God said concerning his son Jesus. Amen? Amen? The second part of John 3, 16 says that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. The whosoever that believeth, not head faith, you believe from the heart. I believe that Jesus died for me, my sin. Amen? He did. Notice in John 3, 18 as well. Y'all getting out a little early today. John 3, 18. I love these verses. Amen. Verse 17. For God sent not his son into the world to do what? Condemn the world. See, God loves the world. But he loves us too much to let us stay like we are. Amen. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen? He that believeth on him is not condemned, so we must believe. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in none other. There is none other name given under heaven among men by which men can be saved but the name Jesus. So you've got to receive Jesus as who he is, believe that Jesus died and paid the price for your sins. Amen? That involves a turning as well. Well, this is the part of the gospel we don't hear much of now. Somebody say repent. Now Romans 2, 4 says it's a godly sorrow that work it repentance. Amen. You repent when you recognize that you aren't all that in a cup of chips, a bag of chips. Amen. You are a sinner. Ah, all of us were in sin. Amen. None of us are good enough. And so that's what confess means. It means to agree with what God says about us. We are sick. We were, man, none of us were living a great life. Amen. We were living for ourselves, doing our own thing. Amen. And God said we were sinners. No, nah, hey, I'm a good person. No, he said none are good. Amen. So we need to believe about ourselves what God says. Amen. And repent, which simply means to turn. Here's what is missing in the modern church, where people don't turn from their sins. You need to be willing to leave what you were in by faith. See, people can stop doing stuff and call it turn over a new leaf. That don't save them. But when they receive Jesus and they believe that he died for him and they're in their minds, they're willing to turn 
have a change of direction. They say, Lord, I'm at the end of myself. I, I can't do that. I can't live this life the way you want it without you living in me. And so I leave the world. Some people don't leave the homies. Some won't leave the booze. Amen. Some won't leave even a family. Amen. Jesus said your enemies could be those of your own household. If I love them more than Jesus, they can stand in the way of my salvation. That's why he said, I, call, I come to bring a sword. Amen. The gospel divides. People don't understand the change that comes in you when you sell out to Jesus. Amen. Everybody you used to run with may not be happy. Most of them weren't happy when you got right with God. Because you were probably the one footing their bad lifestyle. Amen. When they wanted to get drunk, who paid for it? You. Amen. They're not happy about that. All of a sudden, no, I can't roll with that no more. Huh? But see, you repented. You had a change of heart because you came on the conviction of the Holy Spirit that the way you were living was wrong. And so now I'm willing to turn to Jesus, Lord. I ask you to come into my life and change me, which means you call on him. Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever shall call, somebody else call, call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if I recognize my error, I'm willing to turn to Jesus and call on him in faith, he will save me. Romans 10, 8 to 10 says, but what saith the word is nigh thee, even in the heart and in thy mouth, that is the word of faith, which we preach that if thou shalt confess, homo logeo, means that you as an individual say about you what God said. God said, I was born in sin. I can't get right outside of Jesus. Amen. I agree. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised them from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Stop. That's where a lot of people miss it. They believe in Jesus. They believe unto righteousness. But when you say, well, let's pray and ask him to come. Well, I don't believe you got to do all that. Y'all heard folk do that? Amen. That's the thing they need to do. Amen. See, a lot of people believe that's the sad part unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Amen? And so you must call on him and ask him to come into your life. And when the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, he baptizes us into the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. And at that point, you become a new creation. Amen? Your default destination changed. Amen? And now I'm heaven bound. Amen? I've become a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, old things have, be, have passed away. Amen? My old life, amen, is not living anymore. I've died to those things. I am now alive in Jesus. He said, and behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. And so once I get saved, my destination changes which means my eternity changed, my default destination changed, it was instantly switched from hell to heaven. And now, beloved, you and I are heaven bound. Amen? And that's all there is to it. Amen. And because I've changed destinies, his spirit now bears witness with mine that I'm his child. Amen? Now I have his spirit indwelling me to teach me his words so I can understand what he wrote. I'm a new person. All because I chose Jesus. I chose life. Amen? I chose to forsake the world. And guess what, beloved? We, we're not looking back. Amen? Every so often, sometimes, man, life get rusted. Man, I didn't have it that bad before I got saved. Well, the devil kept you in darkness. Amen? Now you're a threat to his kingdom. He wants to stop you. Amen. Keep rolling. Amen. Don't turn. We're, we're too close, amen, to the Lord's return to even consider backing up in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of us need to break the quitter. Amen. Man, I don't know. Break the quitter. Don't, you're not even going to entertain going back. 
If friends forsake me, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep on going. Amen. You know, if they turn their backs, amen, you keep going. Amen. Because you're passing through this world now. This world is not my home. Amen. My home is where Jesus is. Amen. And so, but we're going to see next week that, yeah, in the end, he's going to bring, you know, he's going to have a new heavens and a new earth. But right now, we're going to be where Jesus is. Amen. And our job is to bring as many people along with us as we can. Amen. Because we know it's not God's will that they go to the other place. Amen. And so you and I have an assignment. In John chapter 4, he said, I've called you to reap that which we bestow no labor. The Holy Spirit has gone before us to convict people of their sins. Amen. But how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? Not just pastors, that's all us. Amen. We need to be willing to open our mouths and share the good news of Jesus Christ while there's time. It's getting dark out there. The Bible tells us to work while it's today. The night comes when no man can work. Amen. While we have the freedom to tell people about Jesus, we need to use that freedom. Amen. And share the good news in Jesus' name. They don't have to live in bondage. They can be set free. Amen. And if the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. Glory to God. Amen. I'm going to just quit right here. Next week, we'll pick up with heaven. Amen. But thank God. I don't know about you, saints. I'm glad I'm delivered from that place. Amen. I thank God that you and I aren't going in Jesus' name. But if somebody's here and you're not sure, and you said, today, Jesus, I want to settle the issue. If I were to lie down, if I were to close my eyes, and if I were to pass on, where would I be? Every head bowed. If you don't have the assurance, if you're not sure that you would be in the presence of the Lord, if you're not sure that you would be where he is, just lift your hands right where you are and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, if there's anybody here not born again. The days are past where you can just play around. Amen? If you need to get right with God, saints used to sing this old song, get right with God and do it now. Get right with God, he will show you how. Down at the cross where he shed his blood, get right, get right with God. Amen? Hallelujah. If you're here right now and you're not saved, wherever he is bowed and every eye closed, just lift your hand. If you really believe, Lord, I need to get right today. Amen? God, I've made a mess of my life. Lord, I've dallied around. I've played in sin. God, my feet have been sore by the world, but now, Jesus, I want to turn to you. In Jesus' name, is there one? Amen. Maybe there's somebody else. Well, you've been saved, but, you know, you've been out there and you get your feet dirty in the world and you know you're not where you ought to be. He said, Lord, I need to get, I need to come in. I need to return home. If there's anyone right now, just raise your hand. We'll pray with you. In the name of Jesus, is there anybody? In Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in today. I pray that the message you heard is a source of faith and inspiration in your life. But I want to address this before we close out today. Because we said there were two destinies, one choice. One is hell, which is by default. If you continue to live as you are, taking life for granted, not thinking about your eternity, and not making the decision to receive Jesus, which is a choice, then you won't go to heaven. Unfortunately, the default destination you enter into when you die is hell. The good news and the bad news is that we saw in Matthew 25, 41, that God did not make hell for you. It was made for the devil and his angels. However, because of sin, if you don't change, if you don't repent, if you don't turn to Jesus, that's where you'll go. And that's the opportunity I want to offer you right now. Just right where you are. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there are three things that we covered. Number one, you need to accept Jesus as God's provision for your sin. He is God's love gift to you, to the whole world. Secondly, you need to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day, as the Bible says. And then you need to call on him, receive him into your life as your Lord and Savior. And we call that repentance. When you turn 
I, I realize that my life's a mess. I've lived it wrong, and Lord, I'm turning to you. Won't you do that right now? If you will, bow your head and pray with me. Father God, in Jesus' name, God, I believe with all my heart, Lord, that you died for me, that you were raised from the dead. Lord, I turn from this world, I turn from sin, and I turn over control of my life to you. And I ask you, Lord, to come into my life, live in me, be my Lord and Savior. Make me a new creation and change my destiny from one that would have been uh, eternal separation from you, Lord, to being received into your presence forever. God, I ask you to do that today, and I believe you will as I prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer today and the Lord came into your life, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. God's given you a second leash on life. If we can help you in that decision, feel free to contact us. Our email is harvestchristianfellowshipchurch.com. Our website, I'm sorry. Feel free to contact us there. You can put in a prayer request. If you need follow-up, you can contact us through our, our website as well. And if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, uh, do contact us as well. You know, like it, share it, get the word out. More than ever, people need to know that there is a destiny that God has, and it's involving your eternity, and it's to be with him forever. So until next time when we look at heaven and what it's like to go there and be with our Lord, God bless you. If we can help you, contact us. We love you. But most of all, God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to save you. Have a blessed day and a fantastic week. We'll see you.